Um, so my last lecture is going to be a mixture of two topics. It's the first is going to be, I, I thought, we could, I couldn't give five lectures about tropical geometry without telling you a little bit about the biggest, maybe the first success that in some sense led, has, has attracted a lot of people to this, which is some tropical enumerative geometry. Now, of course, I'm far from an expert on this, there are many experts on this, so I hope they will correct my, um, any corrections. And then the second half, I want to come back to, well, in some sense, we'll come back to, to Peter, Peter's first lecture, and I want to tell you about the tropical version of Riemann Rockland curves. Okay, so that's the plan. <coughs> so we'll start with some numerical geometry. One of the classical variants of the question Joe's been asking us. So the question would be given 3D minus 1 general points in P2, how many rational curves? So how many? Rational curves of degree D pass through. So my p my points are P1 to P3 D minus 1 through the PI. So this is an easy question if D is 1, okay? Then 3 times 1 minus 1 is 2. I give you two points in the plane. And I'm asking you how many rational curves of degree one, how many lines pass through the point, and you know the answer. Okay, so let's say, so we'll call the number here, uh, so ND is the number of such curves. And so 3D minus one is the number that's chosen to make this actually have an answer, okay, to make there be a finite number of rational curves that actually pass through the points. If you're, Fewer points, and we'd suddenly have an infinite number of curves. More points in general position, and the answer would be zero. Okay, so we're set, what we said is we all know that n1 is 1. We also, most should all know if I take, so d is 2. I now have 3 times 2, I have 5 points in the plane. In general position, and now we expect there to be a unique column. So there'll be, so N1, N2 rather, is also 1. Okay, so this one, so the first we, is trivial, the second is an easy exercise. The next case is uh, 19th century, so N3 is 12, this is 18, by Steiner in 1848. N4 is 620, about 1873. Okay. And that's where it stopped for 100 years. Okay, so these things we can maybe have to admit this is something I'm not an expert, maybe experts can tell me can we do this using what we've learned this week? Mm -hmm. maybe or not quite, okay. okay. This is where it stood for a hundred years until we have the following theorem. It's average which will give us a recursion. We'll say N D is going to be the sum D A. D plus db equals d with da and db positive. And now we're going to have, let's see, I hope I wrote this down correctly, da squared, db squared, 3d minus 4, 3da minus 2, minus da cubed db, 3da minus 4, 3da minus 1. Times it and then N D A N D B. Like it's a close parenthesis there. What you should take away from this is that the, okay, it's a complicated formula, but it's a recursion. Okay. The important thing here is that these are both positive. So I'm writing N D in terms of smaller N D of small of N D primes for, for smaller N D primes. So that means you just have to know the answer to N1 which we all agree, there's a unique line joining two general points, in order to know N2, N3, etc. Okay, so what, everything else is just the degree, some binomial coefficients, and then the product of, the, of these, these 
in small amounts. So this is a big breakthrough. What I want to, so this is the 90s. So now the turn, just approximately a decade ago, we now have the sort of the tropical breakthrough, which is McCulkin's correspondence theorem, and which says we could do this tropical. Okay, so McCulkin, so, so the tropical approach is we can calculate these numbers using tropical geometry. So this is larger than the problem. We can say that these can be computed. So ND can be computed tropically. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So we have the correspondence theorem. We call it the correspondence theorem. the number of rational curves of degree d passing through a given number of points in P2, maybe you're thinking P2 of the complex numbers. Tropically, we're going to want to count the number of tropical rational curves oops, of degree d passing through points in the tropical plane, which is R2. Okay, there's a few words in that sentence I haven't, that maybe we haven't actually been able to find properly, so let me say them more carefully as I write this down. So we can say the correspondence theorem says in d equals N D trop, which by definition is going to be the number number of tropical rational curves. So this will mean the graph has no cycle. So there's no cycle. So I told you in general how to draw the tropicalization of a curve. Right? We take, if we're starting with a, a polynomial and two variables, I told you to tropicalize the polynomial, draw the, um, draw the, um, the nonlinear locus, or to where we can take the shortcut of taking the regular triangulation. And it turns out that, real, that every tropical curve in the plane does, it does have this form. So we've got the number of tropical rational or curves. Now we want to say of, of degree d, I want to define, you've seen that like every curve I've drawn has, had some, has, looked, has looked something like this. Okay, occasionally we've drawn other things. But here, degree D will mean I've got two things going to the right, two things going up, and two things going down. So that's going to be tropical degree two. So we've got, that means we've got D going up, D going to the right, and D going down. Um, okay, these are sort of the, the long, the infinite edges. Of course, if you actually look up the proof, because Grecian uses the Max Convention, this would be reflected. So, it's something to be aware of when you look at tropical geometry. So, I've got the number of tropical rational curves of tropical degree D passing through three D minus one in general points. Uh, squared, but now I have to say counted with multiplicity. Okay. So you might think, well, I've got my rational curves, was, and maybe I'm going to work over a more interesting plane. I mean, more interesting here, and I've got my rational curves. If I tropicalize them, my rational curves pass through some points. If I tropicalize them, I'll get a tropical curve that will pass through the valuation of the points I started with. So the only problem is of my original you know, 12 curves I had here, we might, it might happen that several of them tropicalize to the same. It can happen, but luckily, this is sort of the, the miracle that makes this all work, you can keep track of how many times this is going to happen. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt, but you said uh, earlier this week, but one thing you don't know is whether every tropical curve arises from an actual curve. Except in the plane. Could additional solutions to the tropical problem that don't correspond to Absolutely, if we weren't in the plane. 
Yeah. The, the good thing is this doesn't happen in the play. Oh, this okay. is somehow why, why, yeah, it's, maybe I'll say a few more, yeah, exactly. This is why, you've, if you've heard tropical and numerative geometry talks before, you've heard a lot more talks about numerative, tropical and numerative geometry in the play than elsewhere. Yeah, for, I think for, for precisely this reason, because we know the classical numbers are going to agree with the mm, tropical numbers in this case. So we've got so counter with multiplicity, and this is so maybe let's just say this is I mean, so this is the counts the number of I'll say the number of classical reactions. So the number of classical curves that more or less the number of classical curves that drop applies to this. I'm slightly abusing the language to say this because this is not the way McCulkin will talk about it. He, would not, he, he prefers that it's to work over the, in the, over the complex numbers and take limits uh, to, to generate the complex structure rather than you know, talking about tropicalization. But you, I think you can rework this all in this language. Okay? The thing that makes this work is that this multiplicity you can actually compute from the tropical curve. So we get a picture, I'm going to sort of, having told you that I only want to look at curves like this, let me draw a, a curve that doesn't look like this. Okay. If this is a tropical curve, I want to say the multiplicity is it's going to be a local calculation. I'm going to look at each vertex, calculate a number, and multiply them. Okay. And that number is going to be how far, more or less, it's going to be, I mean, the intuition is sort of how far this is from being a smooth, looking like a smooth toric surface. Okay. So I take, and technically I, I look at everything that should be trivalent. I write down the first lattice points, and I take the determinant here. The balancing condition, with the, multiplied with the weights, the balancing condition says this will be independent of which two out of the three vectors I take. So I multiply all of these, and, the, and from this we get a multiplicity. Okay. So, well, what does that? So, what's the point of this? This now says if we want to solve the classical problem, we can solve this new tropical problem. I now draw my, general, my points of general position, and, and you have to now decide how many tropical rational curves of, of a given degree pass through them. Okay, so I look at these two points, and you can see that there's one tropical degree one in curve that passes through them. So a degree one curve, it, it has to have one thing going in each direction. So once I put one thing going in each direction, there's nothing, there's no room for anything interesting. It has to just be a tropical line. We already know, you know, degree one curves are our lines. It's easy exercise, so exercise is draw two points, in fact, everyone who's taking notes, put two points on your bit of paper, check that there is a unique line passing through them. And so it could be, I could have taken my points like this, in which case I would have had to have my line look like this. I have to be careful, of course, we have to say general points. If I had chosen my points to my two points to lie like this, then there wouldn't be a unique line because I could take anything of this form. Okay? But we're already used to this. You already know that we need my points to be general position classically. It's just that for two points, general position means distinct. Okay. So the exercise here is two points, any two points in R2 that got a unique tropical line. Okay, so that's, and that line will be boring, it will have multiplicity 1, so that lets us read off this number in one of these ones. If I take five points in the plane, it's, it starts to get a little complicated, but you can, it's also, you can also check that we have, uh, so, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit, because I can, well, in principle, I can do this, I cannot. So if I take my points to be like this, then we can check that there's going to be a unique degree 2 curve that passes through all of them. So I take five points in the plane and you find, and you should be able to find that there'll be one tropical degree 2. Again, this is degree 2 because it's got two things going up, two things to the right, and two things going down. This is well and good though, so we've turned a classical problem into a piecewise linear problem. It does not necessarily mean it's going to be any easier. Okay? If you don't believe me, if you get bored during this talk, draw five points on your bit of paper and try and find, work out what the unique tropical 
which is purpose. It's not hard, but it's not, but in any given example, you know, at least I don't get it correct the first time. So there's still some uh, there's still an issue to it. Yeah. So how can we go about approach, the approach to conclusions? <coughs> Check that this was really a well-defined end stubble. So it was implicit in, in the description that there was one number, you know, there was a notion of tropical general position, right? And that there was that for almost any way I choose my 3D minus 1 points in R2, there will be the same number of rational curves of degree D passing through them. So the first thing to do is to check that so N D prop. Does not depend <coughs> on the positions of the general points. But this is where you really need this multiplicity because it might happen that you put the points in this, in what you put your, for example, I guess we go after eight points, I think, in, in one position and you'll get. Mm. There are eight points, you get eight curves, say, some of which have multiplicity two to get up to my 12, and you put them in another position and you get 12 different points. I have to, but I don't actually know whether, that, whether those two literally exist, but the phenomena, at least, as I change the position of the points, the actual curves, the combinatorial types of the curves that show up might change, but the num this, this number is constant. Okay. So now, the general ph phenomena is we want to move the points to what I'm going to call special-ish position. as you change okay. So what do I mean by specialist position? I mean they're going to be in still in tropical general position, but particular types thereof. So we're going to choose, maybe I'll leave the to the theorem up. So there's two ways, I mean, well there's several, I think at this point there's maybe three or four different approaches to tropically proving this theorem, which are all, some of which are all variants of each other. So the first, well, I'm going to say, I think I'm saying it now out of chronological order. One is you could stretch, we could vertically stretch them. Which the points. So I somehow have my points being like this. And so I'm going to imagine another point is somewhere down on the floor and so on. This is going to strictly limit the combinatorial types of curves that can pass through these points. So, and this, so, this, so this limits the combinatorial types of curves passing through the points. And it leads to a theory of what's called floor diagrams, which is, so, so Owen Brigolet, the audience, so it's Brigolet, Mokalkin, and then Mokalkin and me, give you a way to turn this into an honestly combinatorial problem. So instead of counting tropical curves, which are piecewise linear objects, we're now counting graphs that have particular properties. And this becomes an honestly combinatorial question. Okay, so that's one way. Maybe that's probably the safety art 
good way to, to solve the question. I want to sort of met, at least mention briefly the Kotsevich, the approach to getting the Kotsevich formula though. And that's, but again, but again I'm just going to mention that very briefly. The other way is, is we can take the, we can move them. So we can say move the points. So I'm going to be very vague. Most curves are tropically reducible. Okay, what do I mean by this? So suppose I had degree two, I might move it so that to, I somehow have two. Let's see how I'm going. I'm going to get this. Mm, I want, so I want to move my my points so that mm, so my degree two curve. So I've got five points here. I want to move them so that. Mm, the only way you can have a curve passing through them is so that you have what, mm, the unique line that passes through these two points, the unique line that passes through these three, two points, and then th there's the intersection point. Okay, so you somehow move things so that everything is tropically reducible. Why is this a good thing? Because you know how many curves pass through these two points, you know how many curves pass through these two points. Okay, so that's going to give you these terms here. So what you do is you sort of rearrange this formula and say rearrange so that this is a positive sum. We're actually counting. So so solve. And then we want to solve a related enumeration problem. In two different ways. That's correct. So what you can do is you move them into two sort of positions. You move them into position one so that every curve is reducible. And that will give you this number. So you, I'm going to say it's a related view. I'm going to put some extra conditions. I'll add a point and I'll, put, I'll add some extra conditions as well. One way you'll get this number. Another way, moving it differently, you'll either get the, 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 the number you started with or you'll get differently reducible curves. So I'm, I mean, I'm leaving out almost all the details at this point. But the idea is that there is a way, maybe the, what you should take away is this is a purely tropical problem. Once we have the correspondence theorem, all of the geometry of the curves has disappeared. We're just playing with these piecewise linear objects. And in either case, the goal is how can we find a way to sort of manage this combinatorics, manage this polyhedral geometry. Okay? But once you've proved this statement for ND trop, given that you know but by Mukaka, the ND trop equals ND, you have given a different proof of Kotsevich's recursion formula. Okay, so that's, and I think that's probably the simplest is proof of this recursion, because at least in terms of the tech, proof technology and how much you have to know to actually read the complete proof. Okay, so that is the first half. If that was just, so in some sense, this was the. If you're going to spend five hours thinking about tropical geometry, you should at least know about one of the biggest success stories, which is tropical and numerical geometry. I would now tell you, spend the rest of the hour though, telling you about, particularly since we heard about it earlier in the week, telling you about the so a completely different topic, tropical approach to curves in Riemann Rock. Most of the week, telling you about, I said, I'm telling you about an embedded theory. So it's the equivalent of an affine variety. So we've spent the time talking about subvarieties of a torus and how to tropicalize subvarieties of a torus. This is partly because we don't have yet a completely 100% developed theory of all, you know, of all of abstract tropical geometry. However, for curves, the story is better. So we do have a reasonable story for tropical curves. So that's what we want to start with now. Okay, so now I want to talk about so abstract tropical curves. Okay. So we're going to start with an abstract curve. It's just going to be a metric graph. So an abstract tropical curve. Okay, so this is a graph where all of the 
edges have lengths. Okay, so we maybe we have five here, seven, two, one, three, and four. Okay, so you meant to think of this, it's a metric space. So you think of it either as a graph as a metric space, so that means when you draw the graph, you know, or I can think of it as a line a segment of you know, an interval of length four, glued to an interval of length three, glued to an interval of length one, two, seven, and five. Okay? So we've got a graph with a distance. But you say, and when we say metric space, we want metric graph, we want to really be able to think of this as a metric space. Well, the vertices, this is really a loop, five. That's a five. Yeah. That's a loop, yeah. That's a loop. Yeah, I have no problems with loops. So the vertices is not Oh, okay, no. So, the, so maybe if we talk about metric graphs, there's no such thing as vertices. Okay? This is a vertex as well. It's just a boring vertex, okay? We're just talking about, yeah, I mean, this is a, it's sort of a choice of terminology. You can either talk about graphs in the usual sense, but a metric graph is technically, it's a metric. It's a, yeah, it, it's, mm, yeah, because otherwise what you have to do, maybe this is a technical point, maybe Alicia didn't like the fact that we had a loop, you might put a vertex here, but we're going to look at an equivalence relation of all, you know, of graphs up to refinement. So, yeah, so it's just a, but if you prefer, just take your favorite graph, I'm allowing loops, I'm a, in the normal sense, I'm allowing loops, I'm allowing multiple edges, and you put distances on the edges. Are the distances always integers? The distances do not really have to be. They don't have to be always integers. Let's take them to be integers for now, though. Just, I mean, I'm going to be a little sloppy about some of these things, but you know, in principle, they don't. In principle, a metric graph can have, you know, mm, yeah, could have arbitrary edges. Okay, so a divisor on gamma, okay, this is meant to be a curve. A divisor on a curve should be a collection of points, right? So it's a, it's a formal sum. So D is going to be the sum A, P, P for P and gamma. Maybe what Alicia was asking about before is sometimes you present this theory where I'm only allowed to put numbers my, on the vertices of the graph. But here I'm just saying, so I might take my, so here we want AP to be zero for all but finitely many people. Is that As we just discussed. Vertices don't exist. So what do I mean? Let me draw a picture. Here's a good, here's a perfectly good divisor on this, on this. So maybe I have a seven here, a two here, a minus one here, and a five here. Okay. Now what I meant before is you could have subdivided the graph. If you prefer to think about graphs, you just subdivide to make this into a vertex. Okay, so we have divisors here. Okay, so a divisor is this way. The, a divisor is effective if all of the AP are non-negative. And so and its degree is just going to be the sum of the AP. So this should all look very familiar from the usual curves. Okay, so we say D is greater than or equal to zero if AP is greater than or equal to zero for all P and gamma. And the degree of D is the sum of the AP. Okay, so our assumption that it's only finitely many and non-zero says that this is well defined. Okay, so the degree of whatever I wrote down here is, so this is not effective at the degree of D is Five plus minus one plus two plus seven is whatever that is. Four, six, thirty. Okay. So if we're going to talk about divisors, we need a notion of linear equivalence. Okay. Linear equivalence should we we should start with a rational function and take its divisor. Now of course we're in the tropical land, so we have to talk about a tropical rational function. If you remember back to the first day. E, we said tropical polynomials were piecewise linear functions. They were just convex ones. Tropical rational functions are any piecewise linear function. Okay, so... Mm, I guess to 
what I say. Oh, yeah. So tropical rational functions <coughs> on gamma are piecewise linear functions. Okay, so now this is why it's important that we think about this as a metric space. Because what's a piecewise linear function on a graph? So you have to sort of imagine, if, if well, let's do a simple thing. If I have a circle, well, each piece locally looks like a line, and then I can just have a piecewise linear function. So imagine that this is a graph of my function above this piece of the, of the circle. So does okay. that mean your coordinates running will run you along each edge? Yeah, it's a metric graph. So that means it's a metric space. Each edge is really an integral. And these slopes are integers? Sorry? And the slopes are integers? Uh, yeah, thank you. And the slopes should be integers. So piecewise linear, sorry, I should have said that. Yes, thank you. Piecewise linear functions with integral slopes. Oh, you mean you're worried about where these points? Yeah. So, oh, so they should be continuous, I guess. Is that the? No, but I mean. The oh, do we care where these are? Yeah. Um, uh, no, I don't think. Well, this is where I have wrote. You, get, you run yourself into trouble depending on. There's a bunch of different theories you can make here, whether you restrict to rationals or to of reals. But there is a theory where everything works with reals. And so let's stick. So here these should be integers, but here I think I'm not going to put any more constraints. Right now, and let's hope that I'm, I'm choosing the consistent one. Okay. So the idea is here: you have to imagine this is a metric space. A rat, you know what it means to have a function from a metric space to the real numbers. If your metric space locally looks like an interval, you know what it means for a function to be linear. Okay. So you know what a piecewise linear function means, and you know what integer slopes mean. Okay. The questions. Does it look happy. No, I'm not happy. So linear is not something theoretical. Okay. Is not okay, so let, me, let me try a little bit more to be detailed about this. Is when I have something that looks like this, and I say length four, this means this is isometric. Remember, it's a metric space. It's isometric to the interval from zero. Okay, you're given this. Say again. You are given this. So this graph, so if you want to think of the graph as a combinatorial thing, think of it as coming, comes with, yeah, you're not allowed to change the speed here, if that's what you're worried about. You're given, there's a standard, of, there's one isometry of standard length, right? Okay. The, how is this a metric space? It's a metric space by okay. making, yeah, by making, by declaring it to be asymmetric. Okay. Yeah. So it's like what they call a ruler axiom in elementary geometry. Each, each segment has a little ruler along it, so right. you measure the distance. Yeah, and it should be somehow uniform along there. Okay, so what's the divisor? Okay, so now hopefully maybe we have piecewise linear functions. We need to have the divisor of a function. So, so f is going to be the sum for p and gamma. Okay, what do I normally do? Classically, you remember, uh, we saw this in Peter's talk. We take the valuation, or I can't, sorry, I'm forgetting the function code language, but we, yeah, we want to take the valuation along the divisor here, right? So what we're going to do is we will take the sum of the outgoing slopes. So I'll draw a picture of this in a moment. Oops, times p. Okay, what this means is if I have a point p here and my function looks like this, so then that means the slope in this direction is 1 and the slope in this direction is minus 1. So that means I would add them up and just put 0 here. Okay. On the other hand, if my picture looked like this, where this had slope 1 and this had slope 1, and I would put a 2 here. Okay. So this says I'm only going to put a number on, on positions where this is going to have, where we'll have a, a discontinuity. Okay. And the fact that I demanded it, well, so I guess maybe we do have to be a little careful with the finitely many breakpoints here. Or the fact mm, means that we should get an honest divisor. So we'll get. Mm. So you might have something, it's kind of hard to draw these pictures, people who, you might have the function go up and then go down again. So 
with some breakpoints here and here, where we might have slope. So we might have a 1 here, a 1 here, and then a minus 1 and a minus 1. So then it's a combinatorial exercise, similar to the algebraic exercise that we saw, that if you take the degree of a rational function, you're going to get 0. But somehow if you go round a loop, you can see that we have to, you know, you've got up and down, you're sort of adding up how much the slope has changed, that by the time you get back to where you started, the slope would better have changed by nothing. And that, that tells you that the degree of rational functions is going to be zero. We need to fix that orientation. Mm, so from every, well, from, I think when I said outgoing, I mean, if I'm at a point, locally on the graph it looks like this, or maybe it looks like this. So outgoing in... Yeah, I guess every point, so every edge, so every edge in the normal sense of the graph, if it, you can think of it as locally it's oriented away from the vertices. I mean, I mean if you have a graph that looks like this and then goes up, mm -hmm. it depends on whether you're reading the, the function this way or this way, whether it's you know, 1 or minus 1. Or ah, no, 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 because it's always outgoing. At this point, I look at the slope here and the slope here. So it does, it's, it's not like going around the, the loop this way. It's I say here, the slope change. Yes, how much did the slope change? So, okay, so the exercise, so there you go. So the exercise is that the degree of the divisor of a function f is going to be zero. Okay, so this is something we expect here. Yeah. This would not be a good tropical theory if this were not true. So now that means we can define linear equivalence. So we'll say d prime is equivalent to d if d prime is d plus the divisor of f, where f are tropical rational function. Okay, and we can define, so that means we'll define L of d will be the set of f, so tropical rational functions, such that d plus f is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and we can define the linear series of d to be the set of d prime, such that d is equivalent to d, and, and d prime is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So all of these definitions we've seen in equivalent language on the board already this week. Okay. So the question is now, what can we do with this? What does it have to do with the classical case? And can we compute it? So the first, well, I guess, it may be before that even, is what's the right notion? It's a slightly strange question. This is a collection of tropical rational functions. Okay? Classically, it's a vector space. Okay? So what are we going to do here instead? What number do we want to go? If we're going to use this, what number are we going to compute? Turns out you should think of this as not as a vector. So unfortunately, vector spaces can tropicalize to two different things. They might tropicalize to tropical planes or tropical subspaces, or they might tropicalize to tropical polytopes. In this case, this is what we should call a tropical polytope. And the problem is that its dimension is not, it's not clear what we should say by the dimension. Okay, so what we do use as the dimension is the ball. So I'm going to define oops. So the idea is roughly you want to say the dimension of the Slivy series should be the number of point con conditions you can impose on your device. So you want to say if I can demand that my divisor contains a particular point in its support, then the dimension mm, was at least two. Was at least two. So, okay, so we're going to say, so definition, this is the knowledge. Everything up until now, if you sat down on a desert island and said, okay, I've, I know a little bit about tropical geometry, let me try and develop curve theory. Everything up until now, you probably would have written down precisely these definitions up to some tweaks about whether you allowed your know, rational or real or whatever. This definition I think is the thing that's, that's still at least to me seems not quite as intuitive why it's. We know it's the right answer, but it's not as obvious why it's the right answer. So it's 
So I'll say R of D is going to be the maximum in, of the degree of E such that the degree, so such that the linear series of D minus E is non-empty for all E and greater than or equal to zero of degree E. Sorry, I have to say, the, so the, as we say, the maximum K such that for all E greater than or equal to zero of degree K. Okay, so that means if my divisor is effective, you know, so I guess we could say if this is, so if my divisor is effective, then, and you know this number is at least zero, because worst case, I can just take the linear series corresponding to just my effective divisor, and E having degree zero. If it's not effective, so if, it's, if the linear series of E is, D is, this will be minus one, and otherwise it might be larger. So you should think about this as I'm saying, I want us to be able to demand that there is a divisor linearly equivalent to my divisor that contains, you know, I can write D as E plus something else. And so this is a classical, so you might remember on the first day, Peter said, when he writes down L of D, and you always have to ask, is it the affine or is it the project, is it the dimension of the vector space or is it the dimension of the vector of the projective space? This is the classically, this is this is the dimension of L of D minus one. Okay, so classically this is the dimension of the projective space. So I'm differing from Peter's notation here at this point. Okay. So this is the, I mean, this is not the normally, normally you define R of D by this definition. You say I have a vector space, I'll take the dimension minus one. But this is, this is an equivalent definition to say this is, a, we could also define it. Okay, so the question now is how, okay, we saw on the first day that you know, one of the big, as we all know, one of the big theorems about linear series on curves is the riemann roch theorem. Okay, how can I do this problem? Okay, this requires a few more ingredients though. First is I have to tell you what the genus of the curve is. So, so the genus of gamma is, well, it's this first Betty number, or if I'm thinking about it as a graph, if I think about it as a usual graph, it will be the number of edges minus, sorry, I think it's correct, edges, vertices minus, yeah, edges minus vertices is plus one. Okay, so this is thinking about this. So this is now if I think about this as a classical graph. So now my vertices are the finite number of, of small vertices. Okay, so and the canonical divisor. Okay, is going to be the sum p and gamma. You, the degree of p, so degree of p minus 2 times p, where the degree of p is the number of edges it's adjacent to. Okay, so that means if I'm in the middle of a classical edge of a graph, I have zero. Okay, so let's draw, maybe it's easiest to draw an example here. Um, so here I would have a 1 here, a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 1 here. Okay, every other point has degree 2, so I put a 0, except for here I have degree 3, so I put a 1. Do you want ends on your graph? Ooh, do I want ends on my graph? Let's, let's not have ends on my graph today. Oh, no. Yeah. Otherwise, but I, I think it, yeah. Then you get minus 1. And you want the plus one. So, say again? I, I want to put a, a plus 1 here. Yeah. So you want to graph the curves. Say again? You can't have a rational curve. Mm. Yeah, so let's, well, okay, let, let's allow us to have, okay, let's allow us to have, okay, we can allow us to have ones and have rational yes. And maybe we can, if, but just to emphasize, you know, here I want to have, if one, two, three, four, I would have a two here, say, and a one here, and a one here. Okay. Okay. So we now have enough ingredients to at least state the, 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 the so now we can state the Riemann Rock theorem. So, 
and actually at this point you just write down the Riemann Rock theorem and I just say yes it's true. So if you want to get ahead of, of the roots, we're just going to, with all of these definitions, so the surprise, so this is the theorem, is we have precisely uh, R of D is R of K minus D plus the degree of D plus 1 minus D. Okay? So all of these objects are well defined, right? I told you what K is, I told you what R of D was, we know what the degree is. We know what one minus. We know what the genus is. Okay, so this is first. Maybe one first proof is Baker by Matt Baker and Sergey Noreen, who sometimes I think this this paper he has an E. He seems to have stopped putting an E at the end of his name. Um, There's a proof by McCartney and Zarkov. And, and then maybe so Rick was just telling me yesterday about their extension of this to, to real numbers, so it's with the student Rodney James. So here we have the Riemann rock there. Okay? That's saying you want to know what this R of D is, you can compute it, so in particular, you can, I mean, all the formal properties of Riemann rock are exactly the same. In fact, thinking about this is a good exercise to understand which, proper, which parts of Riemann rock are purely formal and have absolutely no geometry whatsoever. Okay? So you go through and you decide, once D has degree, you, you, can work, you can work out from this what, you know, well I guess an exercise first here somewhere is, that, so an exercise is that the degree of the canonical divisor is what you think it is. So you can see here that we t I started with a genus 3 curve and I had something of degree E4 and here I had a, a, again a genus 3 curve at degree 4. So you can get it to be what you expect. That's how we get that 2G. How do you tell when the two curves are isomorphic? How do I? So, what do you mean by isomorphic? Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I think we would say, let's see. So, this is, so, it depends on which world we want to live in. So, there's one option is. So we could just say they should be the same as metric graphs. That's option one. Not always the right answer. Option two, once we're allowing, you can get, once I do allow rational tails, we can say if they're the same up to what's called modification. And so this is where I'm allowed to add, so I'm allowed to break things and add some tails. So right, sort of right, corresponds. And yeah, let me come back to that. There's a, there, is, there are some definitions. For now, we don't, I mean, for now we can just have this as a theory, though. I mean, you could, you could say, let's not have a, you could ignore the notion of whether things are isomorphic for now. Cause, because there's only, a, I mean, it's a much more discrete object, right? For a, given, in, for a given genus, there's only finitely many combinatorial types of trees. Yeah, av avoiding these rational tails, there's only finitely many combinatorial types so of, of graphs. If you allow rational tails, any curves of genus zero are isomorphic, they don't want that an elliptic curve is going to be like So an elliptic curve is essentially a circle, yeah. And then its length will be a circle. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is the Riemann Rock theorem. I mean, you can do a lot more, I mean, yeah, so maybe, okay, I guess I would say, yeah, you can do a lot of the, for example, a lot of the four, work out what is the formal properties of Riemann, of Riemann Rock. Like, just as in the usual case, you can work out what R of K is from this. You can work out, you can deduce that for D large enough, if we will have, you know, this is going to go away, so R of D is the degree of D plus 1 minus G, and so on. So all of the things that, you know, you know as, class, as statements about classical curves will follow in the same formal way for tropical curves from this theorem. Okay. So to finish by just saying a little tiny bit about, sort of sketch some ideas of the connection with classical curves. You might just think about this as, this is in some sense, it's, it's sort of, it's cute, right? We said that tropical geometry was going to be a, you know, it's, a, it's an analogue. So this, you, could, you could think about this as just in the, in the analogue definition of tropical geometry. We're doing algebraic geometry over the tropical series. Okay. However, there is more than that. So 
let's talk a little bit about how we get some, some connections with classical curves. So in particular, you can use gauge that you play with tropical curves and tropical linear series to prove classical theorems about curves. So we just finish with that. So we're going to say connection with classical curves.
Tropicutreise. G. Okay, how I take the, the sum in honest vertices of G. So this time I actually mean vertices in the sense that Alicia wanted me to mean vertices. And so by graph, I'm only, going to, I'm only going to put weights here. Er, er, and I'm going to put the number of points, so the degree of, so I said a divisor, specialized to get a divisor D naught. So the degree of D naught restricted to the component V times V. Okay, so I have two components here. Here I have two points, so I put two. Here I have two points, so I put two. Are you assuming that the special divisor is the Am I assuming that this, so that my, say again, am I assuming that which, that the... Special divisor is zero. Yeah. Um... Yes, I guess I am. Yeah, so this is nice, this, you, yeah, I mean, you, you, technically you, you need to throw some niceness assumptions. Where, where, where was my, my family? I should probably choose a, a, a regular, yeah, I should choose a nice enough family, my family C to be regular, maybe. Okay, so we have now a tropical divisor here, okay, and now the theorem. So this is Baker's specialization lemma. Um, is that if I look at the tropical or ranked the linear series on this tropical divisor, so let's see, so maybe we can call this, let's call this trop of D. Okay, so the theorem, this is the Baker specialization lemma. what this is, you might think it's strange if you say theorem and lemma. So I say theorem because I think this is really important. Matt Baker called it a lemma in his paper, and to some extent he's also correct that it's a lemma in the sense of it's not hard. It's, a, it's elementary but important. So it's one of those fundamental observations, and, and this is the following, which is that the R tropical well, let's just write R of trop D is at least R of D, meaning we're here we mean the dimension of L of D minus 1, and because this is a classical, and here we mean maybe the same that classical. And here we'll write trop. Okay, so this is the number that you learn in a, in a curve, algebraic geometry curve class. You, know, you take the linear series on D, you take its dimension as a vector space, subtract one. This is the tropical number I just described. You know, you're playing with you, you, ways to arrange points on a, you know, points on a graph subject to this linear equivalence that I'm allowed to move them by these, these devices of linear series. Subject to the reg, and the theorem is this number is at least that. Why is this a good thing? This is a good thing because if you want, for example, to know whether this is non-zero, if this number is zero, then this had to be zero. Well, th then this was not, sorry. If this was minus one, then this was all definitely minus one as well. Okay, so one way you could do this is you could show the non-existence, or you can use this to, to show the non-existence of divisors with, with particular linear series. So the application, and, So this is work of Cools, so you have to get this, Cools, Payne, no, sorry, Cools, Dreisman, Payne, and Rebeva is you can prove half of the Brunerter theorem. So it's a proof of proof of half of the Brunerter theorem. give you a curve of g dis g and I say is there a linear is there a divisor on this curve that has degree d and a linear series of degree a linear system, and something where r of d is at least r okay. and there's 
this question, so the broad rotor theorem says, for a general, gives you a number rho for which, for a general curve, you expect the answer to be yes, if rho is positive, not negative, and no if it's negative. And they can use this idea saying, we're trying to show something doesn't exist, so I show that this number is minus one, that means that this number has to be minus one. Okay, so this sort of, so again, it's, it's part of the whole philosophy of tropical geometry is simpler. Okay, we're taking some complicated proofs, whether they're a numerative geometry, you know, taking what could say which had to develop the whole theory of, of moduli spaces of stable maps to understand, or you know, taking a lot, a lot of hard work to prove the Brunner theorem and reproving it using these simpler tropical techniques. So, So this is the, okay, um, so whether I can say this correctly at the board, it, it's one of these weird things about tropical geometry that you only need, okay, any time you've got some open set, right, and you want it, you, it, it turns into one of these questions where you have an open set and the only question is, is this open set non-empty? Okay, so let's, I'm not sure I'm going to correctly say why this is this, is this without thinking it through ahead of time. Even, but so we only need to show one, it turns out that it turns into this problem where we only need to exhibit one tropical curve with one for which every, what is, what's the right way to say this, every divisor of the given, if, well, I need to show one tropical curve of genus G for which everything of, of G, for which there are no GRDs of the right, of the satisfied dimension. Okay, because if once, it's the sort of thing where once we had one, then it was true on an open set. You have some open condition and you just have to show that the open set is, is empty or not empty. Yeah. So maybe this is just to sort of finish this sort of maybe my summary sentence. What you should have taken away from these lectures, first of all, the very first thing is tropical geometry, turns algebraic geometry into some combinatorics, piecewise linear geometry. It's almost always simple. Okay? We pay a price, it's a combinatorial shadow, so we pay a price, right? You can't solve every question using tropical geometry, but you can solve a surprising number, okay? In particular, you can solve some of these enumerative geometry questions and also some of these curve theory questions. And I think one thing that's definitely true is we do not yet know which the, the full extent of questions you can solve using these techniques. So there's lots of room for, for people to get into this. So thank you.